Good morning, good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are trying to get more chairs at the moment. So please uh, be a little patient. Um, it was an extraordinary, amazing opening yesterday night. So we had exactly 700 visitors, which is absolutely beautiful. So thank you so much, Bunny Rogers, for attracting so much attention. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the main subject of the show is mourning. And when we mourn, this is rather a very personal, very intimate and individual process. And um, what do you think about the fact that 700 people join you in this morning process? Um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I. I mean, you sent out a press release that kind of covered this, these topics uh, ranging from mourning and funerals, death, those kinds of things. So maybe it has to do with um, my belief that people do want to talk about these things, um, these kind of uncomfortable subject matters uh, are things we all struggle with and, and think about and maybe don't talk about on a regular basis. So maybe that was part of... And do you think it's the it? purpose of art to, to um, deal with this question? Yeah. Um, I have trouble making blanket statements about art that, you know, that isn't... that when I'm not just exclusively speaking for my own process or or what I make, um, but for me personally, the the artwork I make is um, kind of comes out of a motivation to organize um, my my thoughts and feelings and memories and experiences. Um, uh, a lot of which are um, painful, you know. The some of the most vividly recalled memories being uh, those that were painful. So um, I think that, you know, comes through in the artwork. Um. Um, you could think of a piece of art like a painting as a representation of something which is there, let's say an apple uh, on a table or something. And uh, at the same time, the thing is present and absent also, because the apple is there, but it's not a real apple. Oh, yeah. So within any representation, there is this, so, there's some sort of loss or absence um, um, inevitable. Yeah, um, I definitely think there's a detached quality uh, about my artwork, it it is hard characterizing it because I, you know, um, I'm I'm seeing it through my subjectivity. I have the same blind spots that I had when I started making it, so I I'm always going to miss things that other people are going to see. Um, but but I think I am drawn to. Uh, the fact that art is so theatrical and uh, removed from reality in that way and that um, you can create a set, you can create something like something else and, uh, you know, alter details in order to, you know, hopefully warn a certain response. Uh, uh, on the ground floor, you s one would see... Uh, grass and then there's a mound and thousands of roses but there's also a self-portrait uh, um, is this self-portrait a portrait of you 
Yeah, it's um, a photo of me when I was 13, and I had just dyed my hair green. And it's an um, it's you know it's an important photo for me. Why did you dye uh, it? I was uh, <clears throat> my family had just moved to Long Island, and I was very shy and kind of uh, <clears throat> invisible in school. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I think once I uh, went into seventh grade, I. I decided um, that I I wanted to do things, um, you know, I just kind of wanted to go for it. I wanted to, uh, I guess that was the beginning of, like, physically expressing angst or, you know. <laughs> I it's thought I was being different or alternative or something. Isn't it also a beginning of pa <laughs> painting yourself because you... You did your hair green, so you made a painting out of your hair. Yeah, I think I just I, I just wanted to look different, you know. <laughs> But it's a very vivid photography, so you you're turning and you're looking back, and it's also attractive and it's lively. It's not depressive. No, yeah, I look really happy, and um, I think. It captures a moment in time, and photographs are simultaneously, um, you know, sentimental, lovely items, but the, they can also be in, you know, there's also something incredibly disturbing about this frozen moment that you no longer have access to, and, you know, it's a question of, of whether or not that moment even happened, and did it happen the way you think it did? And every time you pick up the photograph, it's um, you're, far, you're further away from that moment and from the person that's in the photograph, you know, if it's of you um, or <laughs> whoever. Could you, you know? imagine to replace your painting by a real photograph or a... Mm, I mean, I considered it, but... Uh, My my personal painting style is um, is one where I do a lot of really thin layers of glazes, um, and I I didn't really start painting uh, until I was twenty twenty one or something, and painting with like um, the. Uh, the desire in mind to like get down as my own style, you know, because uh, before that I was just like copying master paintings and trying to do still lives in th the thickest oil paint possible, and you know, because I heard that that would make a good painting, but um, I I uh, I started painting printout photographs of uh, young girls. And I realized pretty early on that I just couldn't finish any of the paintings. I would get to a certain point where there would be some, I mean, basically like the painting upstairs where there's some shadows and light and, and you can kind of get the basic idea of what's going on. Um, but I could never complete it in the way that um, you know, you would think of a completed painting. And, and I realized later on that it's because the images were so painful for me to look at that I couldn't, um, I just couldn't bring myself to to kind of take it to that level of detail. You know, it, would, it, it always felt like this comfortable stopping point where it would almost be something like where you squint your eyes and that's what you saw. Um, and, and so, I mean, I feel really similar about looking at photos of myself and especially photos of me as a kid. It's, it's hard for me to look at. Um, a lot of them I couldn't look at until a few years ago. Why? Because you, you lost the youth or mm. you lost, um... I mean, in, in a... To answer generally, sure, 
but uh, I guess like we've been talking about already, um, I, I vividly remember my childhood, and then it kind of drops off at age 10 or something, age 12, um, and then it kind of turns into a, a haze of alcohol and uh, drugs and that kind of thing. And then you get onto the college years, which were easily as forgettable. So um, I have this kind of, this box of memories from childhood and, um, you know, I've talked about the, having depression as well and that's been something that's escalated over time. It's, um, I've had my own kind of journey with it where I, I know I wasn't a happy kid, but in my recollection of being a kid, I, I, I believe I was happier than, you know, say, age 15 or age 16 or something, um, when the existential crises started, started pouring down, you know. So we have the image of childhood <coughs> as a as a period of innocence. I don't know if it's true, or, but uh, uh, how would you say what what's what's innocence? Yeah, I'm not I'm not a big fan of the word innocence um, or purity. Um, it seems that once we're born, it's it's already been uh, affected or. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really, perverted is the right word, you know, I, not so much corrupted, because I don't really like the word corrupted either, but twisted somehow, you're already influenced, you know, there's already influences happening as soon as you're born, uh, shaping you and changing you, and um, so I don't really believe in this idea of, you know, the the innocent child or the purity of childhood and um, I also think it makes it, it I think it it makes it um, gent gentler on yourself where it, if you're not comparing the person you were as as a five-year-old to the person you are as a 30-year-old you know, it, it, it's expecting too much of yourself and it's it's being too hard on yourself for having life experiences, which everyone does, you know. So are you supposed to be dirtier or or um, less uh, less legitimate because you 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 aged, you know, I that's the most depressing, you know, thing I can fathom. So I, I don't like it so much. And I'd rather see a life as kind of on a flat plane where it's just, a, you know, it's a flat plane or it's a some kind of cyclical uh, motion where everything's kind of happening at once. Everything you've experienced it, um, in your life is is contained within you you know, from day one to the the day you die and whatever happens after that, so. And actually this exhibition starts with the day you die or the day after mm. you died and it, the, actually the, the start is, is an end. Right. And from there it begins again. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you describe it again? The, the grass and the fireflies and... Yeah, so I mean, there's the the hyper romanticized uh, vision of a funeral for myself on the ground floor um, with all these um, blue roses, which are my favorite rose. It also symbolizes forbidden love, among other things. Um, and like I, you know, mentioned last night. There's a lot of themes throughout the show that I feel are forbidden in conversation or, um, you know, uh, forbidden internal dialogue. You know, it's something you might not feel comfortable with or that, um, 
Yeah, that that might be hard to face even on a personal level. Um, so you have this funeral that also references celebrity tribute, uh, sites of tribute or memorial tribute sites, whether it's at their actual grave or it's, um, you know, the Elliott Smith Memorial, for instance, in Portland is just on a wall, on a street. Um, so I, I like how people kind of just pick up shop wherever they see fitting their, their lost uh, icon. Um, and, uh, and to give it a place as well, um, <coughs> a spot to, to mourn. Yeah, yeah. And a, a, you know, a scene of collecting and, and gathering um, where people are approaching individually, but, but uh, there is some kind of community going on. You're, you're inextricably linked to the other visitors um, regardless of whether you meet them or not. Or, and I think it connects you to the person who died as well. And, and I, I really like thinking about that, like this way in which we are linked to each other, connected to each other without having to to you know say hi how are you and or spend time together you know um, that's a that's a comforting kind of thing for me. Um, you once said in, uh, this week a couple of days ago um, that people that gather in in grieving in this collective mourning they tell the truth. What do you mean by that? Um, I think. Um, well, when you're approaching a, gr a grave site or a tribute site, um, you're coming there for the most part on your own accord. I mean, if it's someone, this beloved uh, character, um, it's there's something embarrassing about it. There's something uh, very vulnerable about um, giving, offering something to someone you never met and admitting to yourself as you're doing it and also uh, to the other people in this specific community <clears throat> that, that uh, you, <clears throat> you cared about this person or you loved them um, and that you're, you're affected by it. <clears throat> Sorry. So, <clears throat> so. Yeah, um, Yeah. I, I mean, as I've been telling you, uh, art making is, is embarrassing um, because it's, it's uh, giving up things that I, I mean, I don't know if I was a different person, maybe I wouldn't say them or um, bother making artwork about it. But um, it's this compulsion, and it's it's an embarrassing one, and um, like leaving tokens at a at a grave site, it's a uh, it also feels compulsory. I mean, you you make a decision to do it, but it it's almost this this calling or this need to pay tribute, to pay remembrance, um, and I, you know I think that's so beautiful, and. The way that these uh, these monuments are shaped, they're shaped really organically most of the time by uh, the growing collection of of tokens and and cards and flowers and that kind of thing. And on the next floor, the the first one. Yeah. Um, so, in the way that the ground floor is kind of this this. Um, theatrical set with the oceanic blue lighting and it's um, um, mysterious and romantic and kind of over the top. The next floor is is almost the antithesis of, of the ground floor um, where everything's been uh, torn apart and the mound is now this trash mound and the, the garbage kind of indicates this um, 
uh, almost like a personal shipwrecking um, because it's it's mostly my personal items from over the years, whether you know they're notebooks or drawings or um, uh, you know my, my ex boyfriend's chair, you yeah, know? Um, uh, Titanic memorabilia, things I've collected. Um, everything's in disarray and scattered about. Um, so rather than this neat, contained, um, pretty tribute, um, pretty gravesite, it's uh, it's another kind of nauseating death. Um, it's a it's kind of the cynical um, version of and the of angry events. version. Yeah, I would say anger is definitely in there. I smashed a lot of a lot of different things in in making that floor. So, and it felt good. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. And there's also the um, subject coming up of um, the history of uh, Diana, the princess. Right. So a lot of um, 1997. Uh, magazines and newspapers that covered Diana's death. I mean, it was an absolute media storm after the the tragic car accident. Um, and you were seven years old. At the I time. was seven years old. Um, but like like I mentioned to you, like the Columbine massacre, um, this TV footage was. Um, I can recall it, f just with with uh, greater accuracy than some of, you know, what you might call the, the most important moments in my life, or like, you know, graduating high school or being my sister's uh, maid of honor. You know, I, I remember some of those events <clears throat> in greater detail than these other supposed uh, markers of a life. So... Um, I, I wanted to in, include that. Yeah, I wanted to include those those papers and the magazines, the the photos, the speculation, the theorizing. Um, it was just turned inside out. I mean, Princess Diana's life and the royal family were just turned. Um, it was the it was news fodder for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, and then. You know, Titanic also came out that year. And the way I've talked about memory before and how seemingly random subjects or seemingly random disparate events or, or um, you know, a red registry of, of sensations can be l linked or can be conflated um, even if it seems on the surface level strange or unrelated or um, uh, or even um, offensive, yeah. Um, the next floor then uh, is totally different. Um, there's another um, type of situation, still the idea to use the space and to an installation, but less immersive. Um, I would say more minimal in a way. And uh, you placed some sort of cement cubicles in the center and um, paintings on the wall. Mm. Um, well, like I mentioned last night, um, you know, you can look at each floor really literally um, at face value for what it looks like and what it is. But you can also think about um, um, the, the title Kind Kingdom referring to a heaven or a potential afterlife and it being something of a sanctuary, you know, uh, that it's kind, that it's warm, that it's welcoming, that it's something to look forward to, to not be afraid of. Um, but when I think of kingdom, I also think of kind of a house of cards, uh, something that's 
easily collapsible, something that's delicate and just in place, you know. Um, so I, I, I kind of see the floors structured this way in this, this almost tower um, where it starts with a, a base in reality or as close to reality as, as the show gets, um, even though it's hyper-theater. Um, and then the my my relationship with mourning is abstracted as as you go up the floors, um, and the cement garden is um, you know it's this kind of um, Stonehenge arranged um, grouping of concrete blocks with the roses embedded in the concrete. Um, so, so, you know, you take, you take something fresh and beautiful and colorful and you're, you're, um, corrupting it in trying to capture it or trying to hold it or pin it down. Um, but, but also it, it, it feels like a literal cementing of, um, the subjects before it, so um, uh, like a a simplification that that it is more minimal and and I wanted it to be more minimal after this you know trash heap. And there's a different <laughs> understanding of time on each floor, right? Yeah. First you have the, really the experience of this funeral, and then it's like the the party after it, and then you get into more longer processes of. Um, the work of mourning, right? And mm. I would I would say that floor is the the longest or the slowest floor because it's it's the frozen floor. It's the like the true winter floor, the the winter of your life or something. Um, and and then you. But have also consolation mm -hmm. or a consolidation of of or a reflection or a giving a yeah. pause. Yeah. Right. Um, and I and I th I felt like it it needed that that space of of uh, that room to breathe after the previous two floors, um, and I wanted to create something that um, potentially would inspire a reflection or introspection or something. Um, and then finally, the shower floor, you know, washes everything below it away and um, it also uh, takes it back to the beginning of this awkward communal grieving this how, how uh, the the showers being a place where you're most vulnerable but also um, it's a it's a college locker alone room together because, yeah. because we we don't have such uh, spaces <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a you know very American. I mean, it's a luxurious <laughs> version of it, but but um, non-functional one though. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, can't can't believe that <laughs> you let me do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you <laughs> for, for indulging me. <laughs> And you repeatedly said this week you like the doors. So I love the doors, yeah. Yeah, there's one emergency door uh, on the northern side of the spaces. And um, it becomes more and more central in your piece. Um, usually we would hide this door because emergency doors you would hide every, anyway. And so, but in your installation, it becomes framed by the tiles and also by the mops, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the is mops... There a sense, is there a sense in the emergency door? Is there what? Is there a sense in it, a deeper meaning? I mean, it's, it's always nice to have an emergency exit, <laughs> you know? Um, I think there should be more in daily life. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
um, when do we feel emergency cases? I mean, I felt it last night when, <laughs> when we had uh, we were on the top floor. That was uh, frightening, you know. Why? I've never been, but I've never had that many people looking at me. <laughs> yeah, at one time. But you do a lot on uh, internet um, presence as well. You started the website with yeah. the age of nine. Yeah, but you you know. There's a lot more people seeing, looking at you. You're not seeing all their faces at once, and um, and and people are so different online. You know, people act different online. Um, Can you describe I think, you know, uh, characterize it? How different then? Well, I think in real life you have to recognize that somebody else is a person, you know, that somebody else is potentially as, you know, wow, as complicated as you are, as, a, as complex as you are. And I think online it's easy to flatten everything else, to flatten the plane. And... Um, I mean, I, that, that's a lot of commentary surrounding, like, um, hateful comments online about people or, like, the way gossip kind of circulates online about celebrities, for instance, or, um, you know, YouTube comments or news, news website comments. I mean, I, I'm always just in... Those com co online comments never fail to disappoint because they're <laughs> I don't even know what what place emotionally comments like that come from. They're so you know hyper emotional and it seems like they should be saved for diary entries or something like but obviously it's this person's outlet at this point in time so get out of the way, you know, they're going to make the comment whether you like it or not. Um, and I think that's how social media does work today. Um, you know, something that's uh, fiery and, and, uh, and heated and full of emotion, one minute is forgotten the next and you're on to the next thing and you've clicked on to a different page or you know, you're watching a different video and you're having a different reaction. So, I mean, the opening was scary because I'm surrounded by other people and on the internet it's easy. Uh, I mean, this is just my opinion. It's, it's easy to pretend that you're the only one who's or you can kind of put yourself at the top of a hierarchy of complexity that uh, my emotions are real and my feelings are real and these other ones don't make sense and therefore are invalid. Um, so, I mean, that's also part of the importance of, uh, of seeing people in person, I think, and uh, to avoid total isolationism. You've created a lot of uh, different identities on the internet, so codings, <coughs> names. Why these strategies to disseminate your personality? Or uh, I mean, I was a kid. I, I don't even remember. I mean, I I think I just was <coughs> was growing up quickly. I mean, just because during those years, you kind of. Um, kind of gain a lot in a short amount of time. Um, so my first screen name was my initials 006 because I was six and not seven. But when I turned seven, I was 007. And, uh, and then I kinda, it kind of hit me that I can make it more representative of my personality. So then it was Catgirl462 because I loved cats. And then it was like this really embarrassing screen name, um, Evil Jello Queen. I don't, I like, it's <laughs> awful. Um, and that was like this Neopets community inside joke, but it wasn't very funny. Um, 
Um, but yeah, so now it's just, uh, oh, and then there's the Second Life usernames and the Fricadia usernames. So yeah, there's been a lot. And sometimes it's just, you know, it's a character name of something that sounds good, like like Sarah Nina. I liked the name. I liked the sound of it because it sounded of the ocean or of the sea or something. And I, I've I've liked that, as you know. I like ocean lore and sea mythology, that kind of stuff. So. And there's two other <coughs> um, things you like. This the one is winter. I like winter and ice and snow, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the second thing is uh, Russia, uh, uh, yeah. Russian culture. I like Russian culture, yeah. uh, specifically um, in uh, ballet, rhythmic gymnastics, gymnastics. I like their approach to these sports, contortionism. Um, yeah, I'm a big but fan of ballet. Uh, okay. And, yeah. and sadness, but because I remember that we had Tacita Dean um, two years ago, and she did a, a series of um, this was postcards that she reprinted in a series of uh, pieces, and there was like disasters and catastrophes, and you would see like a bridge collapsing, or you would see the battlefield of Verdun devastated, and so on. And the final piece of like I think it's 21 images is actually a funeral. Um, and um, the entire series is called Russian Ending because she refers to the, it's kind of a joke too, she, she refers to the Danish um, uh, film industries in the 30s and they produced movies and with different endings for the Western <laughs> <laughs> clients and for, for the Russian <laughs> ones. <laughs> the Russian ones, all the sad ones, yeah. the melancholic ones and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I relate to that, obviously, yeah. But the last question, you said um, um, contortionism, the, the, the body, mm. how much is, is the body involved? Um, well, it, this was my dream that when I was a kid, I wanted to be a contortionist. Why? Because I saw the, the Broadway uh, play Cats on VHS, and I watched it about, you know... 200 times and they they weren't just dancers they were the embodiment of everything that makes a cat and I was completely obsessed with cats I believed I was a cat for a couple of years um I ha I'm serious like I had a cat uniform it was but a beige sweatsuit with green black. dyed cat <laughs> <laughs> that was later this is when this is like seven to nine was the hardcore cat years um i had these cat exercises i'd eat out of saucers and um it, yeah it was deep um but but i saw cats and i just thought they were the most beautiful things i'd ever seen beautiful people and They could sing and act and dance, and they were on my dream set, you know, this, uh, like, cat haven, and it's kind of bewitching, and they have, there's um, implications of dark magic, and it's, there's a lot going on in cats, <laughs> and then you, and then it ends, you know, the character Grizabella, who's my favorite character from Cats, she's like the washed-up beauty queen, Uh, and it's clear she's kind of been through decades of hardship and uh, substance abuse and, you know, other other things um, that you can imply. But um, her gift at the end of the, of the play is, uh, or the musical, is that the cat's community allows her to ascend into the heavy side layer or the cat's heaven. And it's really odd because they're basically gifting her with death, you know, instead of continuing on with this life um, of kind of moping around and singing about her life and beauty that once was, she can just die. It's very, I mean, I didn't get it. I didn't put it together until I was older. 
Um, I just thought that, you know, she was getting taken away for some reason. But, um, yeah, it's, I, I just loved everything about it. So that was, that's where that dream came from. Um, and it's not lost, you know. I still, still try. <clears throat> and the other figure you identify somehow um, is uh, Joan of Arc. Um, yeah, the clone of Joan of Arc. Yeah. I feel like Joan of Arc is too arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but wow. it's from a cartoon, Clone High. And so instead of the original historical figure that we know and love, it's um, a 16-year-old American clone uh, going to school at an American high school and having uh, the problems and, you know, uh, passions and, 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 um, and resentments that of a 16-year-old in an American high school. So when I saw this cartoon, I just found her so incredibly relatable. And, um, and I liked the way she was designed. And, I mean, that has a lot to do with it always, doesn't it? Um, so I, I uh, connected, like, the other, the other character, Gaz, from Invader Zim... She's like the angry um, younger sister of the main character. Um, and I, I saw these two cartoon characters as being like sisters or um, myself at different ages um, or, or best, best girlfriends or something because I had had these intense... Uh, female friendships growing up with just one person at a time and um, yeah so I've, I've used Joan as this kind of avatar um, when I haven't felt comfortable using myself or when I just haven't wanted to so it's and it's you been use nice. it for images right <clears throat> we have this invitation yeah, card where gen you generally yeah. uh, I make I, she appears in animations um, and she also, uh, I will make still kind of draw illustrations as well. And um, last question, could you imagine to replace one of the images of Joan of Arc or the clone of Joan of Arc with your self-portrait in the ground floor? No. Um, no, I think it would be a cop-out for me. Uh, I, th I think it would be allowing myself uh, removal where I wanted to confront this this uh, photograph of me when I was 13 that, you know, I couldn't look at for a long time. So I wanted to force myself to do that. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything... Uh you want to add? Or? I think that covers it about. So, then, thank you so much. Thank we, you. It was great, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.